Okay. Oh, in progress. Okay. I love boarding house reaches. Everybody here. <laughs> All right, let's start with uh, the upper room. And today's Tuesday, the 16th. So our devotion is from Carol Harrison of Saskatchewan, Canada. It's nice. And the scripture is 1 Peter 5, 7. Cast all your anxiety on God because he cares for you. When a women's retreat committee asked me to speak to them, God urged me to share my struggle with depression and how God brought people into my life in answer to my prayers. I did not want to be so vulnerable, but I trusted God's promise to give me the words and to take away my fear. It turned out that one young woman in particular needed to hear these words, know that she was not alone. I can't do it. I'm not as good as this type of thinking often comes into my mind. It makes me anxious. When God wanted me to share the truth of God's word with others, I responded in fear with, me? I can't. But God helped me overcome my fear. God knows our needs, fears, and even our lack of faith. We can go to God, hand over our cares and fears, and then let God guide us in what to do. I might not have the same abilities as my friends. I can't is often still my first response. I'm still learning how to give my fears, cares, and anxieties to God, but I also know that just as God helped me speak about depression, God can help us all to do anything God asks us to do. All right, let's pray. Dear God, thank you for helping us to move past our fears. Help us to trust that you will equip us for the tasks you ask of us. Help us to rely on your Holy Spirit when we witness to others. Help us to enjoy this life as you intended us to do. And Lord, be with us as we go through the study, uh, as we continue to go through Exodus um, this evening. We pray this in the name of Jesus Christ, amen. amen. All right, uh, can you hear okay over the, we have our dishwasher running here. Yeah. <laughs> can you Okay, over or do I yeah. need to pause it? No, no, no it's good. fine. We're good. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Great. yeah. All right. So we're at Exodus 26. And I have some. Um, some pictures. I wonder if I can go on share and if I have it like where somebody can see it. Uh, let's see. Files, maybe. Um, should have prepared this ahead of time. <laughs> well, we'll just do it the old fashioned way. <laughs> uh, I have and, it on my Bible. Okay. So this is what it looks like. This top part, this is what it looks like on the outside. Notice we're going to talk today about there's all these posts that go straight up around the tabernacle. All that stuff came apart. It, it wasn't cemented in or pounded into the dirt or anything like that. All these posts are set up so that they can be easily taken apart. Uh, even the tabernacle can easily be taken apart and moved to another place. The only thing is uh, the curtains over the tabernacle were pretty big. <laughs> and even the veil, uh, it doesn't mention this in, in our reading tonight, but 
they say the veil was very, very heavy. Now, they use a lot of hyperbole when the rabbis and stuff are talking about this. They say, oh, it took 300 men to lift the, the veil and all this stuff. Yeah, well, we know Jesus talks now hyper, hyperbole all the time. Like, if, if your eye is causing you to sin, pluck it out, you know, that kind of thing. So it wasn't just you, Jesus that used hyperbole. The rabbis often used hyperbole too. But what can we get from that? We can get from it that the veil was very, very thick. So it's like a thick carpet, mm -hmm. I imagine. They say it was a hand's width thick. So it'd be like four inches thick. I seriously doubt that. <laughs> but the point is, it was more like a rug than a, a bed sheet. All right. Okay. Um, and then on the inside, you can see how they had the five posts at the end, uh, at the entrance. And there's four where the veil to the Holy of Holies is. And that was hung by clasps. So you could slide it to the side. It, there, it wasn't like two of them where you go in through the middle, like you would think. That would be what I would think normally. But no, you, you kind of slide it to the side a little bit and you go in through the side to the, uh, to the Holy of Holies. So that's how the high priest got in to the Holy of Holies. And he only went in there once a year. We talked about that last time. All right, so let's turn to Exodus 26 and we'll be able to, to hopefully see some of this. Uh, 26, one through six, Paul. Moreover, you shall make the tabernacle with 10 curtains of fine twined linen and blue and purple and scarlet stuff. With cherubim skillfully worked, shall you make them. The length of each curtain shall be 28 cubits and the breadth of each curtain four cubits. All the curtains shall have one measure. Five curtains shall be coupled to one another, and the other five curtains shall be coupled to one another. And you shall make loops of blue on the edge of the outmost curtain in the first set. And likewise, you shall make loops on the edge of the outmost curtain in the second set. Fifty loops you shall make on the one curtain, and fifty loops you shall make on the edge of the curtain that is in the second set. The loops shall be opposite one another, and you shall make 50 clasps of gold and couple the curtains one to the other with the clasps that the tabernacle may be one whole. Okay. So um, in verse two, and it says all the curtains are to be the same size and they give you the thing in cubits. My NIV says that is about 42 feet long and six feet wide. Those are some big... <laughs> pieces of material <laughs> well, they, they had a big group to carry all this yeah yeah it was a lot to carry um okay what what is what are other people's versions say blue and purple and scarlet stuff material <laughs> and mine says yarn Yarn. <laughs> Yarn, yeah. Now, now the interesting to think about this is uh, you can make yarn out of animal fur and stuff, right? But where did they get the colors from? I mean, that amazes me because it's not like nowadays you just go get some, that right uh, yeah, clothing dye, throw it in your washer and everything comes out so nice. You can use dye from some of Yes. Yeah. I found out the hard way when harvesting taro leaves that taro is a really good dye. It won't come out. <laughs> taro leaves. 
<laughs> so, uh, yeah, they they somehow came out came up with these colors, and you know we think of this uh, uh, the brass and silver and gold we hear of, but just coming up with these colors that would be, you know, they they'd be steadfast. They wouldn't like wear out real quick. They they would last. That was something. One thing I heard was about the uh, uh, fact that uh, they they uh, get them from uh, birds and uh, what's the one that's what's that one real powerful one? Oh, peacocks. peacocks. Peacocks, right? Uh, and uh, they use those. Uh, they're very rare, so only uh, royalty can wear purple. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Purple was a hard color to come up with. Absolutely. Yeah. It was made from uh, mollusk. Yeah. That's mollusk right. Mollusk and urine and uh, it turned purple in the sun. So the longer it was in the sun, you had the different shades of purple. Oh. Yeah. So, you know, if you're gathering mollusks, you're not going to have a whole bunch of that stuff to work with to make the purple light. That's why it was so expensive and, and really considered, uh, you know, rich person's color. I'm surprised you knew that, Bill. Good job. Yeah. Right. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, these colors, it, it just amazes me. Any questions so far? There's a lot of detail in there about what we're supposed to do about building the right. supply. Yeah, and, and there's a reason for it. There's a reason why there's a lot of detail. And the reason is it's an image, it's a copy, a rough copy of the God's temple in heaven. So therefore it had to be exact. They, you couldn't just say, well, let's make it this way or let's, let's uh, you know, it's good enough for the government kind of thing. We'll do it this way. <laughs> mm. <laughs> we used to say that a lot in the military. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, seven. Ooh, this is long. I think I'll break this one a little bit. Seven through uh, nine, Stephanie. Next, make tapestries of goat hair or a tent that will cover the dwelling. Make 11 panels of these tapestries. The length of each panel will be 45 feet long and six feet wide. Join five of the panels together, then the other six. Hold the sixth panel double at the front of the tent. Now make 50 loops along the edge of the end panel and 50 loops along the edge of the joining panel. I don't know where nine okay, is let's stop there. All right, so at least we agree. Our, our versions do agree on that, how, how long those curtains are. Um, that's good. Uh, so more, more curtains being made. All right, let's do 11 through 14, Lois. And you shall make 50 glass of bronze and put the glass into the loops and couple the tent together that it may be one whole. And the part that remains of the curtains of the tent, the half curtain that remains, shall hang <laughs> over the back of the tabernacle and the cubit on the one side and the cubit on the other side of what remains in the length of the curtains of the tent shall hang over the sides of the tabernacle on this side and that side to cover it. And you shall make for the tent a covering of tanned ram skins and goat skins. How far do you want? Okay, to uh, through fourteen. I think that's it. Um, okay, so they're talking about the part that goes over this part right here, where the curtains are going over the tabernacle itself. So they don't just cover the top; they go over the whole thing. But if you're looking up, you're going to see that first layer, which was linen. 
And as you look around, everything you're going to see is gold, except for the curtains. And there's no windows. I, that really struck me today because we're going to talk about the menorah pretty soon. And I was thinking, wow, you know, I wonder how, how often that was lit and this kind of thing. And then it came to me, there's no windows in that thing. Now, there, I'm pretty sure there were windows in the, um, in the temple in Jerusalem. But in this, no windows. So that menorah is going to come in real handy. Yeah. Okay. They didn't have windows in, when we had pioneers in this country. It was a while before they had windows in their houses and stuff. There was, you know, they, was, been a long time there, was there was one town mm -hmm. I, I, I was hearing about in archaeology that was really gated. And the, the archaeologists were wondering, what's so special about this town? Well, in this one center place, in, in this building, they had glass. Mm -hmm. Uh, and they were thinking that was glass that might have been from the windows of the temple. So they actually, these people were smart. You know, <laughs> they actually figured out how to make glass back, in, you know, when they're making Solomon's temple and Herod's temple. Smart people. Uh, but yeah, it's, it's not an easy thing. You know, I'm sure most people's homes didn't have any glass windows. Yeah. What's a sea cow? <laughs> I've heard all kinds of definitions for this word because this word does not have a definite definition. So some people are saying, well, it should be uh, dolphins. Some people are saying it should be seals. Some people are saying it should be badger, or was it badgers? Um, they just come up with all kinds of different things. So sea cow, you can, you can substitute probably badgers in there, badger skin. Mm. Uh, but who knows? <laughs> that word uh, has that's used was fallen out of use. We don't know for sure which... It meant. Now, our Bible says that that's Barum, say that is Dugons, D U G O N G S, which, I mean, if I were going to guess, I'd say they're related to manatees. Mm. But we can go on and do some research on that. Manatees are so strange looking. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So they must have taken some of their animals with them. Well, they took a lot of animals with them, but the question is, were they ca capturing wild badgers that were nearby, or were they getting something out of the Red Sea and using that? Stealing as they went. <laughs> they obviously had goats and sheep. Yeah, they definitely had a lot of goats and, and uh, sheep and cattle on their trip. Definitely had a lot. Yeah. All right. 15 uh, through 21. Bill? Make upright frames of acacia wood for the tabernacle. Each frame is to be 10 cubits long and a cubit and a half wide, with two projections set parallel to each other. Make all the frames of the tabernacle in this way. Make 20 frames for the south side of the tabernacle and make 40 silver bases to go under them. Two bases for each frame, one under each projection. For the other side, the north side of the tabernacle, make 20 frames and 40 silver bases, two under each frame. Okay. All right, Holly 22 through 25. Make six frames for the far end, that is, the west end of the tabernacle, and make two frames for the corners at the far end. At these two corners, they must be doubled from the bottom all the way to the top and fitted into a single ring. Both shall be like that. 
So there will be eight frames and 16 silver bases, two under each frame. Okay. Um, so when you went through the temple, uh, this gate right, or this, yeah, this entrance right here was on the east. So you entered from the east and you were facing west, which was just the opposite of most of the pagan religions, which would have you face east towards the sun or the sun god. So that's, that's kind of interesting that uh, you come in from the east and face the west. And uh, I just noticed uh, in answer to the question about why it had to be so exact, and I was talking about how it's a replica of uh, the temple in heaven. Let's all turn, just kind of hold your thumb on this one spot or a finger. Turn to Acts chapter 8. That's easy to find, right? John Acts. Hmm. So it's right after the gospel. Turn right to it. Oh, you turned right to it. Uh, Acts chapter 8, verses 1 through 5. Luke is going to tell us something here. Oops, eight, one, three, five. Okay. Uh, is this the right one? Yeah, I was going to say, huh? Oh, did I mess up? Doesn't look like it. Ay, 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 ay. Okay. Take that back. Let me do a. Let me see if I can get this real quick. Shadow. There's a copy and a shadow. I'm going to look up shadow. Look for New Testament. Oh, Hebrews 8. Okay. Turn to Hebrews 8, 1 through 5. Hebrews, James, and First Peter. So it's right before James and First Peter. Eight point five. Okay. Uh, let's see. Uh, Joyce, could you read that one? Okay. Uh, Hebrews eight verses one through one. Five. Now the point in what we are saying is this. We have such a high priest, one who is seated at the right hand of the throne of the majesty, a minister in the sanctuary in the true tent, which is set up not by man, but by the Lord, for every high priest is appointed to offer gifts and sacrifices. Hence, it is necessary for this priest also to have something to offer. Now, if he were on earth, he would not be a priest at all since there are priests who offer gifts according to the law. They serve a copy and shadow of the heavenly sanctuary, for when Moses was about to erect the tent, he was instructed by God, saying, See that you make everything according to the pattern which was shown you on the mountain. Okay. So there we are. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Now let's turn back to... Uh, a good memory. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, we maybe had a few scratches in the back. Yeah. 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 It's not like they had nice paper to write on. You know, they had. Well, the, the Egyptians had papyrus, but with all these different Bible versions that we have, 
people must have gone bonkers trying to keep the keep the same meeting and in, in, in the better way. Each each version is what's supposed to be clearer or, or have some some difference. To it. Well, it's just like. Uh... English words can have, if you look an English word up in the dictionary, there's lots of synonyms for every word. In fact, you get a thesaurus going. You can have like this huge section of words that mean the same thing as the one word. So that's where we have all these different versions from because you take the Hebrew and then you translate it. Well, there could be a lot of different translations, especially when it's a word that has fallen out of use. And we're wondering, well, it sounds like it means badger or sea cow or, you know, <laughs> but that's what they do. They try to now some versions try to be almost exact word for word, like the new revised standard version tries to be just as right on the money with every word as possible. The NIV tries to make it more readable. And the message is what they call a paraphrased, where it really puts it in everyday language and is super easy to read. So you have um, different ideas behind why they're interpreting the Bible too. If, if their idea is to make it really, you know, uh, like a paraphrased version, it's going to sound a lot different than a version that's trying to translate it exactly, almost word for word, what was written. So that's why you get all these different versions out. Oh, when I take my, or took my mother-in-law to... Uh, Greek church service sometimes. Uh, we would read, they'd have the Greek and then across from it, the English. And that was, uh, that was taken directly from the Greek. And it had quite a different uh, perspective on it than we would say the revised standard version. So, thought that was quite interesting another type of translation right so it's it, i mean that's that's why i'm studying hebrew so that i can get those extra go directly to the source and that's for the old testament greek for the new testament you can anybody can study greek mm -hmm. and translate it themselves uh, in, into English. Uh, I, when I was growing up, I grew up in a Mormon church and they said, we don't know what the Bible really says because it's been translated so many times. We don't know what the original Bible said. And that's why Joseph Smith started writing his own version of the Bible is to get it back together to where it was according to their religion, right? Yeah. But we know, now I know, that's not true. You can go directly back to the original language and translate it from the Hebrew or the Greek right into English. I think the LDS still uses the King James Version. I'm not sure, but I do know this. I, I mean, I, I know that... Uh, their Joseph Smith version wasn't finished. But when I was in that de denomination, we didn't study the Bible at all, hardly. Really? Yeah, it was the children who did the sermons. Um, most of the time was spent talking about missionary work. But now we have lots of Tongans that are Mormons. So we're getting the Bible uh, into that. So that's really great, you know. Uh, the Tongans are saying, hey, we need to, we need to uh, teach the Bible. So the, it's changed a lot since I was a kid, I'll tell you that. Um, but anyway, it's, it's really awesome that we can go back to the original languages. And that's why we have different translations. Is there's just so many different synonyms for each word. And uh, 
you know, it, you have to think about why they uh, translated it. They might have wanted to make it easy to read, or they may have wanted to uh, just try to do it word for word, that kind of thing. Like the King James Version um, is, I, I really like it because it's so beautiful. Yeah. But boy, is it hard to read. <laughs> <laughs> and I speak English as my first language, right? Yeah. <laughs> and, 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 and people don't talk like that anymore. No, they we, don't talk like that. And, you know, yeah. way back when, yeah. in, in, you know, in, in England, you know, they did. Yeah. You, know, they, yeah. you know, and that's why you're seeing these newer translations, the, the message and stuff like that, because that's the way people talk right now. And that's right. And that's what they're, you know, yeah. they're going to understand. It's awful hard when you memorize the King James Version all the time growing up and as a kid. And then you read in a different version, like, well, where is it? <laughs> I can't find it. Uh, it's like, oh. Well, there's some things like, you know, Psalm 23 that nobody can do it like the King James to me. Mm -hmm. It's just so beautiful. Uh, so that anyway, that's why we have all these different versions. Okay, where were we? Uh, what verse are we on? 26? Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, now, we've been talking about acacia wood. And acacia trees grow to about 20 to 40 feet high. And they have, they kind of remind me of what you see in, in African desert kind of thing where the, you see the trees. Because you see this main trunk going up and maybe it'll split into two thick branches going up. And then you have all these leaves at the very top. Yeah, flat on top. Yeah, flat on top. That's that's an acacia tree, what they look like. Yeah, so that's what they're making out of. I hear the wood is uh, at least as strong as oak, if not stronger. It's, it's good wood, good hard wood to they use. that out in the wilderness? And that hat was plentiful out there. Really? Yeah. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> First way people are always chopping down trees. Who knows about nowadays? I grew up in Southern California, but it was a flowering acacia. Oh, and the trunks, of course, fried up the sidewalks and took over the plumbing and everything like that. And I always went barefoot. I stepped on all the bees and the wasps. <laughs> but um, they were oh yeah, and you're right. The wood was super hard. Super hard. Oh, so they're passing around a picture, just like you described it. Shaded giraffe. <laughs> yeah, yeah. wood shaded giraffe. Yeah. Thanks, Paul. Okay, twenty six <laughs> through twenty nine. Bill Kama. Also make crossbars of acacia wood. <clears throat> five for the frames on one side of the tabernacle, five for those on the other side, and five for the frames on the west, at the far end of the tabernacle. The center crossbar is to extend from one end to end at the middle of the frames. Overlay the frames with gold and make gold rings to hold the crossbars. Also overlay the crossbars with gold. Okay, so you'd have these five frames. If you look at this, it's kind of hard to see, but you have five frames on the end, five posts going up, and you have five posts at the other end. Because you only have four where the veil is. And they would have, and it talks about they have one. Well, I don't, I don't think it was just one because um, that's an awfully long piece, but they had, they had uh, it going through the center, going from the front to the back. They had one, you know how we often have like a laminated structural support beam in a house, it's, you know, load bearing. And that kind of thing is all that support. Well, that's what that one beam was for, was to give uh, support to the whole thing. All right. My grandparents' house, I belonged to the middle. 
right. Uh, Ken, how about 30 through 32? Okay, uh, set up the tabernacle according to the plan shown uh, you on the mountain. Make certain, uh, make certain purple and scarlet yarn, yarn and uh, finely twisted linen with uh, cher with uh, cherubim worked into it by skilled craftsmen. Hang it with gold hooks on four posts of an acacia wood overlaid with gold and standing in a on four uh, silver bases. Hang the curtain from the clasp and place the ark of the testimony behind the curtain. Uh, the curtain will separate the holy place uh, from the most holy place. Okay, let's stop there. Right before 34. Okay. So we're talking about the veil now. And what did the veil look like? It had what colors? Okay. And it had cherubim embroidered into it. Not in the front part where you enter in, even though that was about the same size, but on that veil, they had um, these uh, cherubim embroidered into it. And, and it was all hung on gold hooks um, and four posts to give it the strength for it to hang from. Okay, any questions so far? This is the first time, but I don't know otherwise. Perk of the testimony is the term, you know, Ken yeah. read and it's in mind. It's versus Ark of the Covenant. Yeah. Testimony is uh, it's the Ark of the Testimony because that's where the Ten Commandments were right. placed. And, uh, you know, the Ark of the Covenant, they call it that because. There was uh, this covenant that was made, and, and you know, they were, uh, it represented that covenant between God and man. But it's called uh, Ark of the Testimony because of the Ten Commandments in it. It's a good question. And what else was in it? Aaron's and, rod. Aaron's rod, and a jar of oh, yeah. manna. manna. Yeah. Okay. 34 through 35. Uh, Colina. 34 through 35. Sorry, I'll just unmute. Um, and thou shalt put the mercy seat upon the ark of the testimony in most holy place, and thou shalt set the table without the veil and the candlestick over against the table on the side of the tabernacle towards the south, and thou shalt put the table on the north side. Okay. So you have the menorah on the left side, and you have the table of showbread as you're walking in on the right side in the holy place. And right before the veil, you'd have the... Uh, altar of incense so the incense was right before the curtain I'm looking forward to the lampstand we still got have ways to go are we going to get to it 640 yeah we might okay 36 to the end of the chapter, uh, Senefa. For the entrance to the tent, make a curtain of blue, purple, and scarlet yarn and finely twisted linen, the work of an embroider. Make gold hooks for this curtain and five posts of the geisha wood overlaid with gold and cast five bronze spaces for them. 
There's a lot like the veil, but there's no cherubim on it. Any questions before we go to the next chapter? All right. Uh, 27. Oh, I, I have a question. Sure. On, on population density. <laughs> the Israelites have been across the Red Sea and they're out in, and there is millions of them? A couple of million. How do they all fit in the tabernacle? They don't. <laughs> <laughs> first come, That's first the term. answer. They don't. <laughs> when when uh, somebody would come uh, to, to be at the tabernacle, they would have to come with a sacrifice. You couldn't just go in to the courtyard uh, in, in this tabernacle. Now, in the big tabernacle, they have three courtyards, but here they just have the one. And the only reason you go in there is because you have a sacrifice. You have a lamb or a cow. Certain yeah. kinds of things that were sacrificial. Right. Mm -hmm. So, um, and, and as you can see on the top drawing here, they had tables where they could work on a multiple animals <laughs> at a time. Well, they, they had to have stayed in one place for long lengths of time. Yeah. They were not continuously on the move. They were not continuously on the move. That's right. You didn't do all of this. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, yeah, they later on you hear about um, the Levites. They were the priestly tribe with the with the temple that wasn't movable like this one and they would they would take turns uh working at the temple see so they, they had a rotating workforce and they knew what time of year they were supposed to go and and work but here um the only people who would go in here the, uh, Moses, his sons you know, just a few other people. Most people would not go into the holy place, let alone the holy place. So they're just coming there to uh, have the sacrifices done for their sins. But yeah, I mean, these guys must have, it's like I talked about on Sunday, they must have been busy. I mean, really busy because you had you had sacrifices that had to be done in the morning. You had sacrifices that had to be done in the evening. And then you had the sacrifices that people brought. So it was a, a busy, busy place. <laughs> they had to have had some big wagons too. When they're yeah. carrying all these pillars, which are you know, inlaid with gold. Yeah, yeah. I mean, those things had to have been it, really heavy. And what's interesting is, you know. is we'll hear about some of the stuff on the inside it had the poles to carry it, just like the Ark of the Covenant. Right. Yeah. Okay, so let's let's see about that. Um, Twenty-seven, one through four, Mate. Sorry, just uh, unmute. <clears throat> Built an altar of acacia wood, three cubits high. It is to be square, five cubits long and five cubits wide. Make a horn at make a horn at each of the four corners, so that the horns and the altar are of one piece, and overlay the altar with bronze. Make all the utensils of bronze, its pots to remove the ashes and its troubles, sprinkling bowls, meat, forks, and fire pans. <clears throat> make a grating for it, a bronze network, and make a bronze ring at each of the four corners of the network. Uh -oh. 
I think the top one is a good representation of the altar where they would sacrifice because it was built up on dirt and God had told them, whenever you make an altar, make it out of rough stones or just make it out of dirt. Don't make it out of cut stones and stairs and all that like the pagans do. So, um, and you can see on that top one, it would have been easy to remove the ashes. I'm sure they had a lot of ashes to deal with every day. This would be really making it easy to take the ashes out. Uh, <clears throat> Okay, um, uh, let's go all the way up to nine then, five through nine. Question. Yes. Um, there's like a ramp or, or steps on the side of the altar. I mean, it's almost six feet high or five feet high. Let's see how high that is. Three cubits. I don't remember. Three cubits? Yeah, four and a half feet. Yeah. So. I mean, you're going to like put a cow on it? Yeah, and we know they weren't allowed to make uh, cut stones, so they could have had some dirt, dirt all the way. Yeah, a nice dirt mountain to stand on. But he doesn't mention that. Yeah, it doesn't doesn't give us a lot of detail. That's why most of these drawings you'll see are all different. Uh, but that's a good point. Yeah, yeah four and a half feet know. high. That's pretty high. Yeah. I mean, if I'm going to barbecue something, I'm not going to put my barbecue four and a half feet up in the air. <laughs> and the second question is, why would you make, you wouldn't make your barbecue out of wood either. <laughs> overlaid with bronze that must have been a pretty thick overlay i think <laughs> yeah that's really i was kind of surprised when i saw that too my eyes got kind of big reading that yeah you know i had visions of this whole place was bloody Butcher the cows for the altar. Me too. Yeah. And then, you know, Hawaiian, you know, when you sacrifice, uh, you sacrifice the spirit of the meat, and then everybody gets to eat the meat. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, for a lot of these sacrifices, they did get to eat the meat, except for the burnt offering. They weren't allowed to eat the meat. I mean, they just burned it completely, but uh, they don't mention that part. No. <laughs> But yeah, there there was. And uh, uh, like the Temple of Solomon, they do say you can't eat the meat. You burn it. Like the bird well, it depends stuff. on the type of offering. Yeah. Uh, and it's and it, food for the priests. Yeah, it's food for the priests. And, and when people would come for Passover and celebrate Passover and have all these. Uh, sacrifices it was a big barbecue party it doesn't mention that but that's what it was <laughs> yeah <laughs> and, and they loved it because you did like you say eat uh eating meat was not something you did every day it was oh yeah it was it was a special time and i know had a jewish friend he said Everything was covered. I mean, I don't know about it was in the Bible, but what happened to the meat and how you, how you cut it? But you had to wear when you when you butchered the animals. I mean, everything was covered. Yeah, and just make sure it's all kosher. Yeah. When Ray works out at the prison and they prepare the breakfast, there's a rabbi that yeah. that explains how things are to be prepared for the Jewish people. They have their own room that the food is prepared in. And you don't bring in something like something that's cooked from another room. It all has to be prepared in that room. So yeah, kosher is a big deal. It's a real big deal. How, how many Jewish people do they have? Up at the I don't know. Wow. I know they have about 700 people. 
prisoners. Mm -hmm. And there's a rabbi there at the prison? That's the yeah, idea. There's, there's no pastors or, or ministers. They, they come for the services, but they don't, they're not there. That, the rabbi's the only one that gets hired. Hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I didn't know that. Wow. Yeah, I didn't know how often he's there, but yeah, yeah, I met him. He was on the radio yeah. one time. Hmm. Yeah, prison, talking about religion in prison is a privilege. It's not a right. Hmm. I thought it was more just joy. Wow. So where is he going yeah. to church? Not <laughs> 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 many Jewish temples around here. You, know. you think the Greek? Yeah. Yeah, he goes back to Reno. Is that a temple in Reno? Yeah, the synagogue there. Certainly mm -hmm. the synagogue. And they have a lot in Vegas. Wow. Vegas has a synagogue. At least one. Yeah, I'm sure they do. Vegas is huge. They've got to have a synagogue there. Yeah. Oh. Okay. Uh, let's see. So they've they've built this thing. And they put bronze all around it. And it's made out of acacia wood, like Paul said. That's just. <laughs> so they had different ideas about barbecues back then. And make it like four and a half feet tall, make it out of wood, put a lot of bronze around it. Now, if you go inside the tabernacle, everywhere you look is gold. Gold everywhere. Can you imagine that? <laughs> yeah. Now you think about how many people must have been there to get their jewelry and to make everything out of gold like that. I mean, they all they already made a uh, there. There's already that cow that that Moses made them uh, grind up and and drink it, you know, with the water. So uh, this is an amazing amount of gold they have to me. Flash <laughs> light, you know. If you have a candle light, for example, gold well, they came out of Egypt. Too. Yes, yeah, came out of Egypt, and it says they ask people for for mm -hmm. their jewelry and for things like that, any kind of gifts they give them, yeah. and they did. Okay, uh, five through eight. Oh, I, we've gotten everybody on the on the, on Zoom, right? Everybody's had a Lua. turn. Oh, Lua, Lua, do you want to take a turn? Okay. All right. Uh, five through eight. <laughs> someone else you can always skip everybody all right paul five through eight <coughs> then you shall set it under the ledge of the altar so that the net <coughs> shall extend halfway down the altar and you shall make poles for the altar poles of acacia wood and overlay them with bronze and a pole shall be put through the ring so that the poles shall be upon the two sides of the altar when it is carried you shall make it hollow with boards as it has been shown you on the mountain. So shall it be made. Okay. So they need some strong men to carry that. But it's, it's got those poles to carry it with. All right. So let's read about the courtyard now. Nine through 11. Make a courtyard for the, for the, for the dwelling. The south side is to be 150 feet long. The hangings for the courtyard are to be woven from fine twisted linen with their 20 posts, 20 bronze bases, and fastening hooks and bands of silver. The north side is to be exactly the same. Okay, 150 feet long. That's so long. All right, uh, 12 through 15, Lois. And for the breadth of the court on the west side, there shall be hangings for 50 cubits, the 10 pillars and 10 pillars. The breadth of the court on the front of to the east shall be 50 cubits, 
the hangings for the one on the one side of the gate shall be 15 cubits with three pillars and three bases. On the other side, the hanging shall be 15 cubits with three pillars and three bases. Okay. So it, this courtyard is 150 feet by 75 feet. It's a lot bigger than it looks in the diagram. Any questions so far or comments? Okay, I, 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 can't, I hope we can get to the oil of the lampstand today. 16 through 18. Bill? For the entrance to the courtyard, provide a curtain 20 cubits long of blue, purple, and scarlet yarn and finely twisted linen, the work of an embroiderer, with four posts and four bases. All the posts around the courtyard are to have silver bands and hooks and bronze bases. The courtyard shall be 100 cubits long and 50 cubits wide, with curtains of finely twisted linen, five cubits high, and with bronze bases. All the other articles used in the service of the tabernacle whatever their function, including all the tent pegs for it, and those for the court, courtyard are to be a bronze. Okay, so again, inside the tabernacle, everything's gold. It's just heavenly looking. It's just amazing. And then out in the courtyard, it's mostly bronze <laughs> because that's like gold represents God, you know, God's perfection. Bronze is like getting a bronze medal. Not quite as good as the gold. <laughs> okay. Oh man, we're almost out of time. Let's talk about this oil at lampstand. Maybe we'll have to start with that again next week. Uh, 20 to the end of the chapter. Command the Israelites to bring you clear oil of pressed olives for the light, so that the lamps may be kept burning. In the tent of meeting, Outside the curtain that is in front of the testimony, Aaron and his sons are to keep the lamps burning before the Lord from evening till morning. This is to be a lasting ordinance among the Israelites for generations to come. Okay. So especially from in the nighttime, it's supposed to keep lit. Um, Lord was talking about the eternal light we see in some churches mm -hmm. is, is hung from the ceiling and it's got this little uh, lamp and it's got this little light and that thing's on all the time. Well, that's the way it was with the menorah. Uh, they always had the, the one candle uh, was always lit. But like I was mentioning before, I was thinking about this, there's no windows in this thing. So there is some light, maybe they push that front curtain to the side a little bit, so they get some light in, but <laughs> it's still probably pretty dark in there. Yeah. Um, Josephus says about uh, Herod's temple that three of the seven lamps were allowed to burn during the day. And then all of the lamps were burnt during the night or were lit during the night. So um, I, I have a feeling there are different traditions during different eras, but one thing you could always count on is that these lights were lit during the night and at least one, one of the lights was on during the day uh, throughout all these different temples because there's this one and there's Solomon's temple and there's Herod's temple. So you have these different temples. Um, this, uh, I know I've read it somewhere. This lamp stand is made out of pure gold. It's made out of like one piece. <laughs> so it's not this huge menorah that's like this. It's probably more like this because it's, it's made out of solid gold. This one isn't covered, something covered, you know, like acacia wood and they covered it. No, this is, this is really beautiful and it's all made out of gold. Um, and then 
Hanukkah is this year from November 28th to December 6th. I was wondering if we were already in Hanukkah last week, but I looked it up. And so it starts November 28th. Ah. Um, and there's an interesting story behind that. It's also called the Festival of Lights. And it commemorates the victory of Jewish rebels by Judas or Judah Maccabee and his brothers over the armies of Syria in 165 BC and the liberation and rededication of the temple in Jerusalem. And they found this jug of oil. They, they, they looked and most of the stuff wasn't usable. It had to be like an unopened jar of oil that was pure. And they found this one and that jug of oil, they, they, the first day, <laughs> they lit one of the lights of the menorah because they knew it would be eight days before they'd be able to get more oil. So they had to, they, they're thinking, well, maybe I'll just light this one candle. And then maybe the second day we can light two candles. They kept lighting more candles every day. And, on, and it lasted all the way till they got that new jug of oil on the eighth day. And that's a big miracle that they celebrate because it shouldn't have lasted that long. And the Festival of Lights, say they, they add another candle lit every day during that uh, festival, that celebration. Uh, okay. I think that's it. Any questions? Is it true that olive oil then burns the cleanest? Good, pure olive oil, virgin olive oil burns really well. Yeah. And they had the weirdest candles back then <laughs> because they could have made them out of beeswax. I mean, there's, there were bees back then. But it was this, like a dish that was curved and it had a hole on one end to put a wick in and you, you, it had like a hole at the top, a big hole at the top and you put olive oil in there and it would go to this wick at the end and that was your candle. That was pe what people used for candles back then. It's pretty awesome. Oil lamp. Just yeah. like an oil lamp. Hmm. You had the jar with the oil and you had your wick that soaked up the oil. Yeah. Yeah. And you lit that and you know, you know, you had that. It was its ancestor. <laughs> well, maybe I'll try to get a picture of that kind of thing for next time. Uh, How many sons did Aaron have? I don't know. I know what you think. Aaron and his son shall tend it. <laughs> yeah. Well. Those are, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I can look that too. How many sons did Aaron have? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> the younger brother always gets the tough job. <laughs> you got to spend the night. <laughs> okay any comments before we go to prayer so the menorah was in the tent of meeting yeah in that first room they call it they call it tent of meeting there okay but it wasn't called that before I, i've heard it called usually called like the holy place yeah um and that's where it was. Yeah, the menorah was on the left. The table for the bread was on the right. And the incense was right before the curtain, the, right before the veil. So they went in that way too, huh? They went from in. Sideways, from the side? From the front. From the front. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they went in through here. This side is open just so you can see. <laughs> so... So I was wondering what this other thing was here in the front, right here. Oh, good question. That's, 
That's, Are those full of oil too for some? It's full of something? water. Oh, okay. And um, to put the fire out. <laughs> 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 when the occasion would caught fire of the altar, right? Yeah. No, it was for the priest and they'd wash their feet and their hands before they went into the holy place. And also before they dealt with all this meat, you know, you want to wash up real good. So that's what it was for. It was, think of it like a, it, it was kind of like a wash basin, like we have over there, except there was no exit for the water. So that's, that's a good question. That's what it was. So the veil that was ripped when Christ gave up his life was the veil that was between the holy of holies and the holy place. Yes. And in the in Herod's temple, I hear that that the room was taller. It wasn't 15 feet tall, it was taller. So that was an even bigger <laughs> veil they had back then. But uh, they they pride themselves on how thick that veil was, and to think that that would just tore couldn't have just given it up you know uh <laughs> yeah yeah that's really uh a big symbolic miracle that god did to say hey we've now this separation between god and man is is no more it's is opened up. We can have direct access to God through Jesus Christ. So that's a big, big thing. Okay. Any prayer requests? Um, yes, please. It's um pretty crazy in New Zealand. Um, a whole lot of uh, nurses, doctors, and teachers and all the healthcare, they they just lost their job yesterday. Um, there's quite a few thousand people. Mm. We pray for them, please. Yes, we had that on November 1st here in America. Okay. Thank you. Good prayer request. Okay, Ken. Um, I started work uh, Monday at, at uh, Ridley's Market in your checker. Uh, never worked one of those machines. <laughs> and uh, so had one uh, training day on Monday and today it was dynamite. Everybody came out to shop. And I was, what, what, what do I do? What do I see? All of that. Please <laughs> think of me in your prayers. Uh, yes. But uh, I work there Wednesday, and then I go see my cardiologist on Thursday. And so uh, it, it's one of those standard things that I do it's a follow-up on a test that we do about once every Connie and I do every about three years mm. and uh, so think of her and she's scared to death but I think she's all right but please uh, give her uh, some prayer on that and I, I thank you okay we can do that. Anybody else? Steve Moses, who works at the you know food bank, helps out the food bank. Um, he has COVID pneumonia. He was in ICU Ooh. at Salt Lake City for I don't know how many days. He's back home now, but he's on oxygen twenty four seven. He uh, his his wife Brenda said. He can't talk a couple minutes on the phone without being out of breath and everything. It hit him bad. He works at Food Bank? Mm -hmm. On Mondays. He works on oh, Monday. Okay. Last, last Monday of the month. Last Monday of the month, which okay. is your day, you know, so 
and him and his wife. They've been they've been doing that for what probably a year at least. Mm, and, that's uh, great. You know, so yeah, he needs our prayers. Yeah. You know, you know, and then fortunately, and you know, having spent time with Steve, or you know, Steve, you know, at the food bank and talking, he's one of those uh, deniers, and he did not get vaccinated. He was, you know, he's one that didn't believe in the virus, and you know, all the, you know, typical ultra conservative is, is what I would call him and he didn't get vaccinated and now he's he's paying the price yeah but his wife wasn't vaccinated either but yeah she hasn't got it well she got it she so, got it but, but no it symptoms nothing, nope, nothing asymptomatic yeah no. she had some, she oh, she had some mild symptoms mild symptoms and no problem yeah, yeah. so <sighs> okay anybody else well, Raymond, Raymond called this this morning, and I guess his family is okay. So they, they all tested positive, but he's he's up and about. <laughs> That's good. Because I know they were pretty sick for a while there. Yeah. And I, I know some others that have been like uh exposed and quarantining so it's this stuff still going around town i wish we had it over with yeah okay any others you know, for your thanksgiving um they had the food train this last weekend you oh know, yeah bring, bring a bag of food or whatever for a free train ride we ended up with not over 900 pounds of food oh my food. goodness yeah. who who was saying i i think oh yeah it was bob was saying i can do it by myself <laughs> uh, oh he carried yeah he carried he brought the bags over yeah on saturday he only brought about two -thirds over. <laughs> well and then, and then uh sue winder brought bags over on monday yeah and what she said was they had so many people on Saturday that they filled up the train and were turning people away that they had to do a special run on Sunday. So, wow. we, so we got like 700 plus pounds on Saturday and then she brought over another 200 pounds. Nice. On Sunday. Nice. And then of course Ridley, Ridley's is doing the uh, sharing his carrying bags mm -hmm. and we've already gotten in just one week, we can have or whatever. We've got 160 plus bags already. Pretty good. So we're filling up the shelves real quick. <laughs> All right. Anybody else? All right. Let's pray to the Lord, shall we? Dear Heavenly Father, I lift up uh, Ken to you and we're thankful for this job that he has to make some extra money. And uh, we pray, the Lord, that you uh, just help him to really take on all this. It's tough for a teenager to learn all this new stuff and the prices of, of uh, food and all these different things uh, that he has to look up. I just pray that you bless him and help him to be efficient and effective at that work. And we Pray for him and Connie as they go to the cardiologist this week. And we pray for others from the congregation that are on the road, uh, including myself, that you watch us as we go and as we come back. And we lift up Steve Moses to you as he has COVID um, and pray for healing for him. We're thankful for, for the healing for Raymond and his family that they're back on their feet again. And we pray, Lord, for uh, those in New Zealand who are uh, facing losing their jobs if they don't get a vaccine. Uh, as I've said before, Lord, just pray that you um, help them to make the right decision. I won't say what that decision is, Lord. I pray that you uh, help them uh, with this difficulty that they have. Uh, and and Lord, that they be able to work it out. Uh, we pray for, uh, we're thankful to hear about the food train 
and all the food that was donated by people uh, to the food bank that that food can go out, especially a time like this. And, uh, you know, as we're getting close to Thanksgiving, uh, and we're thankful for Ridley's doing their sharing for caring. And uh, we know we always get a lot of food uh, to distribute from that too. We're th so thankful for those who have the heart to give to help others who are not in as good a place as they are. And Lord, we thank you for this um, Bible study that we've had tonight. And we say this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, you do. Thank you for joining us. See everybody. you guys next week. <laughs> yeah, we'll see you next week. No, Bye, might everyone. be hard for you to get on Zoom, but she can get on this and see you all. That's really great. <laughs> <laughs> Bye, everyone. Oh. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Thanks again for joining. Bye. Keep Bye. well. Bye. 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 Stop recording.